WHO is concerned, very frankly, I do believe that WHO is severely failing in its duty of promoting world health by excluding Taiwan. As a result of that, you have now got a black hole within the, the WHO uh, system of monitoring. And that is a very dangerous thing in any system, whether it's a financial system or a health system or a defense system. You have a gap in that system. Well, then that's, uh, that gap is actually represents a security threat. And thanks to WHO excluding Taiwan and frankly excluding Taiwanese views, a massive security threat developed which has created a lot of problems for the rest of the world. So I hope that the WHO now, now that India is playing a more prominent role, I hope that WHO will ensure that Taiwan comes back to it. And because the reality is, the reality of Taiwan cannot be ignored. We can't talk in a formalistic or legalistic way. We have to talk in a realist and practical way because this is a practical world. It's a real world. It's not a world. That, that, that is there only in the abstract. Right. Uh, so let me go to uh, Dr. Lai. Dr. Lai is actually cannot go and get on the Zoom platform, so he's patching into the mm -hmm. WhatsApp call. Dr. Lai, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. So Hello? I want to know from you, what did Taiwan do right in its handling of the COVID-19? What are the main lessons that the world should learn from Taiwan for, for the handling of its virus? I think um, the way that we handled the COVID-19 drew a lot from the lesson that we learned from our dealing with SARS about uh, 17 years ago. And in both cases, unfortunately, Taiwan has always also been excluded from WHO and not really been helped by the WHO on both cases. Uh, during the uh, year 2003, when the SARS uh, pandemic came up, the, uh, uh, we have learned a very uh, uh, tragic uh, lessons. We caused about uh, more than 70 lives in Taiwan. About uh, we need to be able to be vigilant, uh, confronting uh, any uh, sign of the uh, problems uh, that might uh, result and. Uh, that may come out as a result of the pandemic. And so that in this COVID-19 uh, cases, first of all, uh, right after the SARS um, pandemic and 70 years ago, Taiwan established a uh, early and health, a public health emergency early warning system. And our hospitals and our uh, health clinics uh, have been practicing uh, those uh, emergency drill uh, almost every year. And it has been placed on the highest uh, examination priorities for the government to review in every hospital. If the hospital fails to pass the test, then the hospital will be fine or they probably will be forced to close down in, uh, uh, within a certain years. So that before the COVID-19 really happens, uh, it seems that the Taiwan has been practicing and uh, tried to meet this challenge uh, for some years already. But even with that, it's still not uh, not enough because the the way that COVID nineteen came out, uh, I think it is one of our um, health professionals. Uh, we have been uh, be uh, watching very closely about what was happening in China, so we pick up every single uh, detail or every single signals that might come out uh, as a result and uh, as part of the uh, public. A health and health crisis. So that's uh, one ex uh, in, about the COVID nineteen. One of the example was that um, we has been followed uh, about the Wuhan cases uh, for a certain month, and then on December uh, things started to accumulate it until one day. I think it is one of our health officials uh, who came across whether from the uh, uh, the reports by Taiwanese businessmen in Wuhan or uh, his colleagues uh, working, uh, his Chinese colleagues working in Wuhan uh, within some of the Czech group. 
he discovered something that is very uh, problematic. And immediately, uh, through some meetings, not only there's an internal discussion, but also uh, one of the reasons was that uh, our health official decided that he, uh, they need to notify the WHO. And unfortunately, WHO just ignore uh, their notifications. But at the same time, those health professionals also started about uh, how we should deal with COVID-19. So they started the whole drill uh, right uh, on the second day, that is the year 2020, January the 1st. But um, the whole thing really uh, uh, comes come, uh, comes on uh, places uh, was that uh, not, about the, not only about the health professional, but it is the, uh, uh, the working of uh, to uh, ensure we have enough personal protection equi equipment, uh, which is the uh, uh, the critical, uh, critical, critical important in ensuring our national uh, our nationals uh, their health uh, to meet the challenge. So that uh, we started the whole of government process uh, in the probably and second week of the January, and then. Uh, so the production of the uh, personnel, uh, personal protection equipment uh, and the uh, uh, health hospital drill, as well as the public uh, sanitation uh, requirement for every uh, citizens in Taiwan, uh, they all started to come out together. So I think this is uh, another lesson that we learned or another thing that I think we do uh, to ensure the uh, uh, Taiwan right now still we are able to control uh, the problem about the COVID-19. But the third thing that is also very important, in addition to the so-called health professional in our early warning system, as well as uh, the uh, production of personal uh, protection equipment, uh, is that the um, government really took the uh, public uh, declaration and the emergency notifications uh, to ensure the uh, the news is transparent and uh, the uh, uh, people they are all being informed. This is very, very important in ensuring the social cohesive and also the social trust among each other. And because the pandemic like this, that requires every citizen not to be panicked they require every citizen to be able to have a confidence that uh, their safety or the uh, the future, that uh, there is a way to deal with it. And the government is able to work with them uh, to meet those challenges. And so I think the, uh, the third lessons uh, we learned uh, from SARS as well as the COVID-19 in Taiwan uh, was that, is that the uh, uh, public uh, trust through the governmental uh, initiative of uh, information sharing and to make sure the whole process is transparent. That is also very, very critically important. And uh, it is this process and in, uh, make the uh, citizen in Taiwan, they have the full confidence about the government and believe in the government will be able to ensure their own safety. And so that our society that uh, they, we can still maintain the order and even uh, maintain the openness within the society. So this is the lesson that we learned. Congratulations on that remarkable success of Taiwan. Uh, now moving on from COVID-19 to the foreign policy domain. Uh, one question that I have is, uh, Taiwan was able to balance its uh, relationship with both the, the US and China very well over the years, uh, primarily because of the fact that both the countries were on good terms with each other. But now with the US uh, pushback on uh, China, what what will Taiwan do? Uh, I, I believe that question probably was to me. Uh, okay, yes. I think the, uh, the issue right now is that, that we do, right now we are having a very good relation with the United States. But the, uh, the China <laughs> does not see eye to with Taiwan. And the, uh, the electoral victory of the President Tsai Ing-wen, uh, China um, was very upset uh, about uh, the, uh, the Tsai being re-elected as a president. Um, <clears throat> and basically, the, uh, the China uh, seeing the uh, pro progressiveness of Taiwan as well as Taiwan's uh, in a better term with many other countries, uh, Beijing just doesn't like it, and they are sending uh, fighter jets to harass Taiwan in a more frequent and a more uh, potent way. They also uh, send out the aircraft carrier or other um, uh, battleships um, to harass Taiwan in in Taiwan proximities. 
So yeah, yeah. So right now that uh, we do not have a good relationship with China, uh, but I think the uh, uh, the issue is that uh, we need to maintain a are in favor of freedom and democracy. In this case, is that uh, the United States is critically important to ensure the uh, balance of power is in favor uh, in this in in a, in a way that's beneficial to Taiwan. And also, it is important to know that uh, uh, to China, uh, although China is big and strong, but uh, we uh, for a small country like Taiwan. What we need to do is that uh, we need to stand on the ground and strengthen ourselves and make China know that, that this is our position, rather than uh, uh, trying to uh, standing something in the middle uh, so that China, uh, Beijing government will believe that they can push Taiwan, uh, forcing Taiwan into a certain positions, because Taiwan always will adjust itself. Uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the importance of standing on your ground make the Beijing government know that, that there are certain red lines that they just cannot cross. This is also very important in my view. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Uh, Professor Dalapat, uh, for years you have advocated for a very close relationship between India and Taiwan. In fact, uh, you had also brought Madam Tsai before she became president, uh, to, you had brought her to India. Uh, and in fact, Gateways was, was the only think tank to host her at that point in time. Uh, what can we do to promote uh, this relationship in the domain of trade and technology? Also, uh, what can India do to attract this Taiwanese uh, tech investment? Well, I'd like to say that, you know, Dr. Sai is a strong believer in democracy and liberal values, and she believes in that globally. Now, the reality of the situation is we are now talking, the Chinese ambassador gave a speech recently in which he warned India against decouple. Well, I would, I would like to say that the, uh, a large part of the world has now started decoupling from China for very obvious geopolitical grounds. And I have written quite some time ago that this is, a, this is going to happen. This is inevitable. Frankly, I'd like to say the Taiwanese have been started their decoupling about four years ago. And partly that is because of Chinese policy, because the Chinese you know, tried to completely restrict the Taiwanese and they tried to narrow the contacts and create as many problems as possible. So Taiwan, in a sense, had the obvious option of reaching out to the rest of the world, including Southeast Asia, South Asia, etc., which the Tsai government did. But that decoupling has continued for quite some time. And the reality is, therefore, in the case of Taiwan, I would like to say, even though there's substantial investment of Taiwanese in the, uh, main, in, in, in the PRC, I think you're going to find that eventually Taiwanese businesses will have to decide, are they Taiwanese businesses or Chinese businesses? And if they're Taiwanese businesses, they will have to decouple. You're seeing, for example, Foxconn. You're seeing, for example, where you know, other very important uh, manufacturers are concerned, such as the manufacturers of computer chips. They're essentially, in the old days, you could produce in Taiwan, sell in the United States. Well, that's more and more difficult now. And my sense is in two or three years, it will be impossible. So if you're producing in China, you'll have to sell in China. And given the trajectory of Taiwan, the decoupling, if you're selling in China, eventually you'll have to go and relocate in China. I don't think more than about 20% of existing Taiwanese businesses will make that kind of a transition. So they, therefore you have a very talented group of people. And you know, a large part of the China dream was because of the boost given by Taiwanese brains, Taiwanese brain power, Taiwanese investment, Taiwanese marketing skills, their financial clout uh, to, uh, to the Chinese. Now that skill, that brain power will obviously have to locate all, all, all options. India can be an option if you have a proper policy uh, structure. And very importantly, if we are very clear as to whose side we are on. Today, I can tell you, it's no longer possible to be on both sides. You know, we, we used to talk about non-alignment between, between the US and the Soviet Union. In effect, it is alignment with the Soviet Union. I mean, uh, I, I'm not you know, critiquing that policy. Today, if we are, those who are talking about non-alignment, frankly, they are living in a world of the past. Either you choose China, or you choose those who are, you know, who are reacting against China. And the Taiwanese have made their choice electorally 
uh, more than four years ago. They have repeated that choice. In, uh, and now over the next four years, I think de that decoupling is going to continue. India can be a very valued partner of Taiwan. I think you can see a significant degree of investment, a significant degree of brain power. And I'm also talking about Indian brain power going to Taiwan. I believe tens of thousands of Indian techies can relocate to Taiwan. The way they are flooding San Jose, the way they are flooding Silicon Valley, they can also flood Taiwan. Because once Taiwan is completely relocated in the, if I may say so, the democratic world, as Dr. Lai said, well then, Indian brains are an obvious corollary of that. So I only want to say, we need a policy framework and above all, we need to give up an ambivalent system and an ambivalent mental attitude. And we need to understand who are our foes, who are our friends, and, and then join hands with our friends to resist the foes. Thank you, uh, Professor Narapath. Uh, Dr. Lai, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Narapath said, Taiwan has great technology uh, strength, one which China especially uh, covets. Uh, how will Taiwan now compete with China, uh, especially on this particular front, and also the rest of the world? I think you are correct that uh, uh, we have a certain technology strength. And I think uh, in Taiwan, in, in terms of Taiwan India, there's a famous uh, phrase in Taiwan that is uh, Taiwan uh, produces a lot of engineers, but India is able to export a lot of CEOs. <laughs> so that uh, probably it will be Taiwanese engineer working for the Indian CEO and that uh, the joint hand will uh, create a bigger strength of, uh, um, for those two nations. But uh, joking aside, that uh, the way that uh, we are uh, working on and try to compete against China is not that uh, we are trying to compete against them in terms of the forces, but uh, we try to compete uh, them, uh, with them uh, in a healthy way. That is... Um, uh, we try to uh, be innovative and we try to <clears throat> uh, respect the rule of the laws and uh, um, uh, the uh, democracy as well as the respect for the human rights because we believe uh, those are essential to uh, nurture a society that is uh, that will be respectful for the innovations and uh, in, uh, and respectful for the ingenuity. And both, uh, both elements are very important uh, for the technology uh, and production, especially for the technology that is uh, useful for the uh, human development, rather than technology that will be used to dominate against other humans. I think that's a key difference. So yes, they, uh, we do notice that China also pay a lot of, uh, store a lot of resources uh, to advance its own uh, technology <clears throat> And, uh, and even achieve a certain degree of uh, uh, advancement. But the issue is that uh, the uh, technology uh, is to serve the human needs rather than uh, technology to dominate other human. And uh, so this is uh, what we believe that a good technology and a technology that can sustain uh, will be the one that uh, has to be built upon the democracy and respect for the human rights. And another thing we would like to say is that the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, in terms of the competition uh, and also the uh, working relationship, as uh, some, something that uh, uh, Professor Nalapa earlier said regarding the, uh, the so-called decouplings, I have to say that it is precisely the way that Chinese, uh, Chinese government is doing its own, to its own people and are doing to uh, people to other world, uh, to other nations that uh, make other countries, they decided to push back and decided to uh, lessen uh, their uh, footprint in China. So it is not the Chinese, uh, we are decoupling from China. It is Chinese it decoupling itself from the whole world. Uh, it's, it's just that some of the country, uh, this, uh, uh, probably uh, some of the company, they still believe that they can harness uh, the latest uh, uh, well of the health uh, wells in order uh, before they want to get out. But the issue is that the way that China is doing is unsustainable because uh, there is no reciprocity and there is no respect of each other's interests, and uh, they do not play a fair game. So that so the, the so the whole fundamental issue is that uh, there is not uh, when we talk about the lessening about the footprint in China, uh, it's actually what China did that came back to itself. So it is not about the coupling from China, but China decoupling itself on the whole world. So I'll just end up here. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now let's open the discussion for the Q&A from the uh, audience. Uh, I can already see some questions in the chat box. Uh, one interesting question has come from uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambaule, who says that if India gives immediate permission to Taiwan to open a Taipei Economic and Cultural Center office in Mumbai, then what message will, uh, will Taiwan take away from this decision? This is for Dr. Lai. Okay. Uh... Well, I think probably this is this is a wider question regarding the Taiwan-India relations. Yes, Taiwan right now we have office in uh, New Delhi as well as in Chennai because China is one of the uh, the site that the Taiwan many Taiwanese businessmen believe that that they have a lot of potential for the uh, uh, manufacturers. Uh, yes, uh, the government is thinking about opening an office uh, in Mumbai and. Um, so right now, it is actually due to the negotiation between the two sides, uh, how to negotiate, when to start the negotiation, as well as uh, how the uh, uh, India, uh, how would that India would like to open a second office in Taiwan? Because I also believe that uh, Taiwan, although it's compared to India, uh, Taiwan is small in size, but uh, there are very, uh, uh, various parts that's very different. Uh, and the uh, office in Taipei probably won't be able to cover uh, the full strength about Taiwan and uh, the American and Japan, they have their office uh, set up in Kaohsiung, that is southern part of Taiwan. I would encourage India uh, could also do the same. Another thing about it is that uh, the uh, Taiwan-India relation, as uh, earlier when uh, uh, Professor Nalapa just said it, uh, I just talked to some of the, uh, the big Taikam uh, in Taiwan uh, the last week. And right now, they, all of them, they talk about it. India. They are thinking about uh, having something big in India, and not just that. Uh, their uh, upstream uh, supplier also asked them to uh, think about India and invest in India. So I have to say that although right now current India, we have a bilateral trade about the seven billion dollars. Probably that is not much in comparison with India and China, but the uh, uh, the number definitely will increase, and investment from Taiwan will also increase. So this is something that I that I know for sure. Okay, uh, Professor Nalapath, uh, you, we spoke about the tech sector, but uh, can you tell us the ways in which may, India can partner with Taiwan in the manufacturing in the tech sector? Well, I'd like to say that, you know, getting involved in supply chains is a very important component, even of foreign policy. Now, I mean, uh, you know, as I mean, I, frankly, uh, when I meet some, uh, you know, some Taiwanese senior leaders, we discuss uh, inconsequential subjects. But in my view, I think the Taiwanese are very carefully ensuring that they become part of the democratic supply chain so far as defense and security is concerned, whether it is cyber security, whether it is uh, defense production. And I think more and more you will see Taiwan playing an important role in that. I believe India can be a very important global player in the supply chain of the democracies in defense equipment. And that is a very, very important point to mention. You know, we had talked about Kaohsiung. I would fully say that Kaohsiung was an ideal location because I believe that it's only a matter of time before the Taiwanese realize that Hong Kong is in serious trouble as a global financial center. Macau, frankly, can never reach that level of being a global financial center. Hong Kong, in my view, is slipping because of the greater control exercised by the mainland in Hong Kong. And Kaohsiung, in my view, is going to come as an alternative to Hong Kong. It is going to come as a global financial center. And I think it's important for India to go there and be there before this happens. You know, the problem with us is we should not be reactive. As the Prime Minister Narendra Modi correctly says, we should be active. And one way of being active is to be present in Kaohsiung. And I think that's a very good idea. The reality is, Samir, that the, the potentialities for India-China tech cooperation are immense. The reality is, so far as Asia is concerned, there is no country other than India that can replicate the benefits of what China gave them in the 1980s. In terms of labor, in terms of costs, in terms of you know, sheer size of the country and its market, and very importantly, as a logistics hub. So I would say what Taiwan did in China in the 1980s, they can repeat in India from in, in, during this particular decade that is you know, coming to 2021 20, onwards. 
and i think that needs as i said smart policy and uh, a bit and, and skillful diplomacy thank you uh, dr lai uh, two uh, two of our audience members have asked this question uh, saying uh, uh, how confident is taiwan is that usa will come to taipei's aid should there be an action across the taiwan strait or if china attacks taiwan well um yes uh, right now that uh, we have fairly good confidence about the taiwan us relation and the united states co uh, commitment uh, to the uh, security across the uh, taiwan strait or the security is uh, in the east asia um but I think the fundamental, uh, fundamental importance of ta uh, Taiwan Strait uh, security and Taiwan uh, is on is about the defense strength in Taiwan. Although the China is big and China has a nuclear weapon and China, especially in the last several years, uh, seems to be able to uh, develop a fairly advanced uh, ships, uh, fighter jets and missiles. Uh, many of them, they seem to be very threatening. But I have to say that, that even with that, uh, for China to want to take Taiwan, uh, it is not just a cakewalk. They just kind of came over, and with all those uh, weapons and uh, threatening, uh, they believe that they can conquer Taiwan in like 24 hours. No, there's no way. And uh, we have a confident, very good confidence that uh, although we will compete against China uh, <clears throat> ship by ship, uh, plane by plane, but uh, we are we will be able to ensure that they will suffer tremendous uh, costs uh, if they should they wanted to conquer Taiwan or should they wanted to uh, uh, have a war in the Taiwan Straits. That we have this confidence uh, and that we believe that this uh, the uh, unity about nation and uh, the determination of our citizen to safeguard our own country and especially. Uh, with the uh, determination to uh, safeguard the uh, hard-won democracy. That is the biggest strength uh, in Taiwan. Chinese uh, Beijing government fear its own people, so they have to rely on weapons. But in Taiwan, we believe our people, and uh, we believe our people can fight. So this is our biggest strength. Right. So uh, we are actually uh, uh, it's 6 o'clock uh, the Indian time, and so that, is our, that was our allotted time for the webcast. But with the permission of the two speakers, I'm going to take Three more questions, if that's okay. Go ahead. I mean, yeah. So uh, one question that has been asked is, uh, apart from the tech uh, uh, and the, the trade probably, what are the top three sectors that India and, can, uh, and Taiwan can create long-term synergies in? This is for both uh, Professor Nalapath as well as Dr. Lai, but I'll start with Professor Nalapath. Yeah, uh, I'd like to hand that over to Dr. Lai because, you know, okay. he has been active on India-Taiwan trade for a long time. In fact, for a very long time even during the Chen Shui Bian administration. So I think it'll be, it'll be better to hear from Dr. Lai about that. Dr. Lai. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. I think the, uh, the, uh, the Taiwan-India uh, uh, sectorial uh, corporations, uh, I think in terms of technology, first of all, definitely it's a, an IT sector, and then a semiconductor, that uh, the two of them, they are uh, very important. And when we talk about TSMC, they have set up the plans in the uh, United States. I think that also uh, tells the whole world about how the U.S. believe in the TSMC and to be a uh, safe and also the most uh, most advanced uh, technology they, they, they treasure. Uh, and I think that uh, in Taiwan, in India, uh, there's a complementary uh, uh, cooperation that we can have in terms of the uh, uh, high-tech sector in the IT and also uh, in the semiconductor. But in terms of the semiconductor, one of the big issues is that um, the semiconductor, the, the way that Taiwan was able to do uh, is that we uh, segregate some of the uh, different production chain. So like uh, upstream, the uh, uh, design, uh, IC design, and the uh, midstream about the uh, wafer production, and the uh, lower string about the uh, testing and pack packaging and testing. We sort of outsource them to uh, different companies. And then all of them together uh, with the uh, congregation, we were able to uh, produce a, a big group of the army that can compete against anybody. And like other countries, uh, many of them, they uh, have the one company trying to do everything all by itself. So that I think for India, if they uh, we wanted to work, uh, so the important thing is that uh, probably uh, either uh, we are able to join in terms of the uh, congregation as army so that uh, some Indian company, according to their own strength, they could participate in testing and packaging 
or the IC design or others. Uh, <clears throat> so I think this probably this is the, the better way to move forward. Another technology cooperation, I believe that the Thai India we can work on is actually on the space. Because Taiwan right now, we are really working on trying to look at how to develop our own uh, satellite as well as our uh, rocket uh, technologies. Uh, in terms of the uh, India, I think Taiwan is really looking toward, forward to uh, the uh, uh, nicety as well as technology advancement from our Indian, Indian engineers, because India can teach Taiwan so much. Uh, and the third uh, about it is that uh, we are talking of, uh, is on the uh, biomedicine. So the uh, Taiwan, although we are very, uh, also a good investment in the biotechnology, but uh, India uh, is famous for its own medicine production, as well as some of the genetic engineering uh, 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 relationship. So that uh, the uh, biotech uh, and also some other uh, bio-related um, uh, technology cooperation, uh, I do see a lot of potential that uh, Taiwan India, we can work together. Thank you. And in fact, uh, Dr. Lai has also uh, commented in the chat box to say that we need Taiwan to start language institutes in India as we uh, cast out the Confucius Institutes uh, from the country as well as from other parts of the world. Dr. Lai, one more question. It, this question we received in advance uh, from one of our audience members. Uh, the, I, I'll just read out the question. Is the status quo of not formally declaring independence, yet removing reference to Republic of China, the way forward for Taiwan? Or is there another scenario that you foresee? Okay. Um... I believe right now the uh, uh, we have uh, Taiwan do face a lot of challenges, including the Chinese uh, military threat, and uh, probably the, the threat is uh, uh, growing uh, uh, even more stronger. Uh, and yes, there are a lot of people in Taiwan. They believe that uh, it is important for Taiwan to declare independence in order to uh, really achieve the so-called uh, statehood uh, in the face of the Chinese. Uh, uh, aggression. But I think right now the government, as well as the majority of the people, believe that uh, the most important thing to, is to strengthen uh, Taiwan's uh, institution as well as our defense and uh, our economic capabilities, so that we could lay down a foundation for the survivability and, and sustainability uh, for Taiwan uh, before we go out to uh, decide to go out to call for independence or other uh, nominal uh, issues there. Uh, and I and another thing about it is that China, uh, they are, for them to want to attack Taiwan, they they have all kind of reasons. The so-called declare independence is just the one of them. Right now, China even advanced to the notion that the uh, Taiwan uh, rejection, Taiwanese rejection of Chinese uh, version of unification, uh, is equivalent of Taiwan independence. So that even though we are not declaring independence, and China already decided that we declare independence, so the, the declare independence is no longer uh, that kind of big issue in my view. Right. Uh, I can see many more questions, but I'll, be, I'll take one last question, which is about the 5G. Taiwan makes the equipment for the 5G, but uh, uh, where do you see Taiwan's uh, role, uh, playing its role in this un unveiling 5G grid game as Chinese 5G um, companies like Huawei are uh, uh, banned from, uh, from the markets? This is what Dr. Lai. Okay. Um... Yeah, when we talk about 5G, I think uh, in Taiwan, year 2014, Taiwan already made this decision in the 4G that we rejected uh, Huawei outright. So that uh, right now when uh, people uh, the, uh, in, in other countries, they are thinking about uh, trying to have a clean uh, 5G or 6G uh, telecommunication um, uh, equipment, that they are now facing the uh, uh, how to deal with the Huawei's presence. Uh, and Taiwan, since we already made a decision uh, six years ago, uh, and uh, we have virtually no Huawei in 4G. So uh, our, uh, the, the issue for us is rel relatively uh, simple. Um, but I think in terms of the 5G, uh, the important issue uh, is just, it's not just about the, uh, whether we want Huawei or not, but the important issue is that how we are able to uh, develop a new standard uh, so that the uh, technology will be able to be secure and safe. Uh, I have to say that like 10 or 15 years ago, about the uh, cyber, about the cyber security that wasn't uh, 
of the big issues. And when the, although the hackers or the uh, computer virus was already uh, rampant, but the people at that time uh, thought of those uh, basically are from some smart people, uh, smart individuals, their, uh, their tricks. Uh, they try to uh, get something or prove they are so uh, proficient in the in the computer technology. But right now, the uh, cyber uh, cyber threat and uh, cyber crime that is so rampant that uh, it started to become a uh, a business or an enterprise, just like a mafia that is uh, working over there. So that the uh, cyber security becomes a serious one that is here. But I uh, but I take that as analogy that uh, for the about the five G because five G is going to to be more uh, basically uh, connect the whole world in, in a way that we can never uh, imagine. And uh, for that, uh, we need something that's more advanced than the current notion about the cybersecurity. Uh, it is not just about the, uh, uh, we uh, prevent other burglars from invading the house. It is basically uh, the cyber health or cyber hygiene that, that, uh, that uh, should, uh, should be like in the future uh, society where the fight your uh, when we advance to fight your 6g so the issue is that uh when we talk just like we are talking about health insurance that becomes a necessity uh for everyone in uh in the current society i have to say that the cyber uh <clears throat> insurance or the uh, cyber health that will probably all be the uh, also be the requirements uh, for every citizens in the five year six Gs uh, world. And the Huawei in this case is the first virus we need to get rid of. But uh, even uh, take out the Huawei, we still have to face other issues. So basically, I think the uh, about the five G uh, and the five G and beyond. Uh, the uh, the real questions like this, and, and for that, uh, we need to have a democratically countries that come uh, come together to discuss about what will be the future, the more health, the cyber hygiene, uh, and uh, what kind of the public uh, services or the international convention that need to be there in order to ensure. The, uh, cyber hygiene uh, for everyone uh, in the whole world and for the citizen of the futures. Excellent. Excellent. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lai and uh, Professor Nalapath for these uh, unique insights onto India-Taiwan relationship. I'm sure in the coming days we'll hear more of this uh, bilateral uh, going forward. Uh, and thank you to the audience also for these wonderful questions.